Great, thank you, Michelle. And uh, let's get started. Welcome, everyone, to this webinar. Um, I, I guess I'm going to tell you about a few things that we've been working on recently, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. So let's see. So let's get started. Um, as I said, what I wanted to tell you about today is some, some areas that we've been working in our security lab lately. In particular, I wanted to tell you a little bit about new developments in password hashing, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, sort of a new approach we developed for uh, securing program control flow. This falls into the area of what's called control flow integrity, and I'll tell you about a new technique for control flow integrity. Hopefully, we'll still have some more time, and then I'll be able to tell you about uh, other recent work that we've been doing, uh, specifically on uh, IoT security. In particular, how do we know that IoT devices are not revealing too much information about their owner? So, again, kind of an exciting uh, area, having to being an in intersection of privacy and security. So, I hope we'll, I hope we'll get through all three topics. But if not, I guess we will schedule future webinars, and we will cover whatever we didn't cover today in a, in a future webinar. Okay, so with that, let's get started with password hashing. And let me remind you a little bit about how password hashing works and kind of the areas that we're uh, interested in, uh, we've been working on recently. So, of course, everybody knows, you know, there are constant attacks on server-side password databases that result in large-scale password breaches. So I just collected a random sample. You know, this is a very small uh, sample of the actual breaches that have happened in the last couple of years. Um, so just to remind you, you probably you remember in a, a few years ago, LinkedIn lost um, a collection of, of uh, hashed passwords that they stored. Unfortunately, they simply stored hashes, SHA-1 hashes of their password. These were unsalted, and we'll talk about the consequence of that in just a minute. Um, so that, that was one event that, lost, that resulted in the loss of 6 million passwords. All these people had to uh, go in and uh, reset their password. Of course, when a password breach occurs, um, whoever does the breach is able, in many cases, to obtain many of the original unhashed passwords, and those can then be used to attack those users on other sites as well, because unfortunately, still many users use the same password at many different sites. And again, we'll talk about mitigations for that in just a minute. Uh, then later on, uh, a year later, there, was a, there were a couple of other breaches. Again, this is just a selected list. Uh, so there was um, 250,000 passwords were uh, stolen from Twitter. Evernote had an issue where hash passwords were, were revealed. And Adobe had an entertaining uh, breach where, um, in fact, encrypted passwords, not hash passwords, were revealed um, in addition to the password hints. So as a result, uh, the password hints actually helped attackers recover the original passwords. And then furthermore, um, just a more recent example, in 2015, a famous, um, a, a fairly common password manager was actually had an issue where, in fact, a hashed master passwords and assaults uh, were compromised. And again, that um, can, in some cases, that can enable what's called an offline dictionary attack, where an attacker can try lots of words in the dictionary until he finds one that hashes to the user's password, and that essentially reveals the user's password. So the question is uh, what to do about that. And so um, this was just a quick uh, survey of what's happening. The question is can we, how do we store passwords in a way that makes these offline dictionary attacks harder than uh, simply just trying all the words in a dictionary? So let's talk about you know, uh, how to store passwords 101. And so of course, I hope everybody knows that you ever, never, ever, ever, ever store passwords in the clear on the server. What you actually do on the server is you store uh, a hash of the password. Here you can see the hash of the password along with a salt. The salt is denoted by SA, and the salt is also stored uh, in the database. And then when a, when a user um, submits a password uh, for login, what the server actually does is it simply hashes the password along with the salt and checks whether that's equal to the stored hash in the database. And if it is equal, then the login is allowed to go through. So again, this is uh, why we use assault and so on. This is uh, fairly common reasoning in computer security. We discuss this actually at quite a bit of length in the computer security class uh, that we teach, uh, which again, you are very uh, welcome to, to, to sign up for and attend. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about the reasons for the assault here. What I want to talk about today is, is, is this question of what, what hash function should be using um, for hashing passwords. So how do we actually hash passwords when we store them in the password database? So what happened with LinkedIn is, unfortunately, they used a SHA-1 hash of their password. And in fact, a SHA-1 hash was even unsalted. So literally, all they did is they computed a SHA-1 hash of everybody's password. And that's the value that was stored in the, in the uh, password database. When that password database was compromised, 
Within six days, almost all the plain text passwords were exposed. So 90% of the passwords were actually revealed. And the reason that was possible is because SHA-1 is an extremely hash, fast hash function to evaluate. So uh, what uh, folks were able to do is run through a large dictionary, um, you know, a very, very large set of dictionary of, of possible passwords in a dictionary and simply try to hash each one of them until they got ones that hit values in the password database and that enabled them to recover the original passwords. So in some sense, this is kind of counterintuitive into what's happening in computer science. Typically, we want things to run fast, as fast as possible. When we hash passwords, actually speed is detrimental to security because the faster the hash function is, the faster an attacker can try uh, all words in the dictionary until he, rec he recovers the user's password. So what we really want for password hashing is much, much, much slower passwords. And by the way, I should say that LinkedIn has since updated their uh, password scheme, and now this is this type of attack is not going to happen again on LinkedIn. So that's um, at least we hope, and so that's actually good news. And so the question I want to ask basically is, what is the right way to hash passwords? And so basically, there are kind of two ideas that come to that come to play. Uh, the first one is when we hash a password on the server side, one thing we might want to do is instead of just using um, a simple hash function where we directly just give it as input the user's password, we actually use what's called a keyed hash function. So a function that in addition to the password also takes a secret key. The secret key itself is going to be stored in some hardware security module, what's called an HSM. So the secret key itself is going to be stored in some secure environment that uh, attackers will not be able to extract. And as a result, um, if they're able to steal the password file, the, pa the password database, if they want to try a lot of words in the, di in the dictionary, now for every word in the dictionary, they have to interrogate the HSM in order to recover, to check whether their guess is correct. Now, the HSM might be rate limited. For example, the HSM might only respond to 1,000 requests a second, in which case the attacker is going to take too long uh, to mount his attack. So definitely using key hashes on the server where the key is stored in an HSM is a, is a very strong and powerful step forward. But in many cases, there is no HSM. For example, when you're hashing passwords on a laptop or when you're hashing passwords on a, on a cell phone, there are actually no HSMs available, uh, roughly speaking. And as a result, we'd like to have something, a mechanism that, work, that is secure even if we don't have an HSM. In addition, also, HSMs do not provide foolproof security. Maybe there is some still way to recover the secret key from the HSM. So in addition, in addition to the HSM, we'd like to also hash the password using what's, what's called a slow space hard function. Okay, so again, these are complementary mechanisms that work in tandem. If you don't have an HSM, you would just use a slow space hard function. Uh, and that would, um, uh, you know, be kind of an alternative to using a keyed hash function. So what I want to talk about is what is a slow space hard function and which one should we use? And there's been actually a lot of progress on this recently, and that's what I want to tell you about. Okay, so the first idea um, uh, dates back actually to the 90s. And the first idea essentially, again, very, very clever idea, which is to say let's use a slow hash function, so one that actually takes quite a bit of CPU power to evaluate. And examples of that are functions like pbkdf2 and bcrypt. So pbkdf2 is actually a standard that folks can use and very, 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 very commonly deployed. For example, Apple uses pbkdf2 in many of their products. The way pbkdf2 works is essentially it slows down the hash function basically by iterating a hash function over and over and over and over again, right? So to evaluate the function, you sort of have to take your, your hash function, evaluate it on the password, evaluate it again on the result, evaluate it again on the result of that, and iterate that, like, say, 100,000 times or so um, until the final result is the actual hashed value. Okay, now, it turns out pbkdf2 does actually more than just simple iteration of the hash function. That by itself, simply iterating a hash function is actually not secure. You have to do something more, and that's, that's what pbkdf2 and bcrypt do. And so, uh, all the, basically what that ensures is that when the CPU is evaluating the hash function, it takes actually quite a while to evaluate the hash function. So now, uh, in fact, uh, when the attacker wants to try, you know, billions of words in a dictionary, it's actually going to take the attacker quite a bit of time to try all billion words in a dictionary or, you know, even however many words there are he's trying to, uh, to evaluate until he's able to get the user's password. 
So the question is, how many iterations uh, should we do? That is, how slow should the hash function be? And typically, um, you know, this would be set so that you can evaluate the hash function on a modern uh, server about a thousand times a second. So that means that the actual server uh, that's doing uh, password authentication at the website would be able to evaluate the hash function about a thousand times a second. So a single server can handle about a thousand logins per second. Of course, if you have higher uh, load on your server, you would just, you know, you would have to buy more hardware, deploy more servers to handle that load. But that's typical, typical parameter that uh, one would use uh, for determining how many iterations to actually run. Unfortunately, there's a problem with that. This is not uh, quite secure. And the reason, the, 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 the problematic issue here is that when a, an attacker attacks you, they're not, when they're running their offline dictionary attack, they're not going to be using your hardware. They're not going to be using the hardware that the website is running. Instead, they're going to be using custom hardware to do their attack. So, for example, they might use GPUs to compute the hash function. GPUs, as you know, are very parallel. And, you know, if a GPU, for example, has uh, 100 cores on it, it could actually do 100 evaluations at one, in one step, basically evaluate 100 words in the dictionary in one step. And, in fact, you can even build commodity hardware that uh, using, uh, you know, ASICs and so on, where uh, the hash evaluation is even faster. And in fact, the attacker can do a dictionary attack much, much, much faster than 1,000 evaluations per second. So let me ask you, here's a puzzle for you, just so that this is a little bit interactive. Let me ask you, so if you have to guess, um, when we were specifically building SHA-256, if we um, uh, evaluate, if we uh, use SHA-256 as our hash function, uh, how much faster could SHA-256 be made to run on a custom piece of hardware over running it on just the standard Intel processor, say Intel Skylake a Xeon uh, processor. So, so how much faster can ASIC um, be compared to, to standard ASIC, uh, to standard Intel uh, uh, processors? Yeah, so I'll let you answer this, uh, this question. While you're answering the question, uh, let me kind of explain why commodity hardware is so much faster than just, you know, off-the-shelf Intel processors. So here I have uh, an example. Uh, yeah, so here I have a picture of an Intel processor. Uh, I just took a picture of uh, Skylake, which is the latest uh, Intel processor on the market today. You can see here, uh, this is a four-core processor. So you can see here the four cores. This is one core. Uh, this is another core, and so on. And you can see that there's a lot of other stuff on this processor. For example, there's a lot of cache that's, going, that's being used here. In fact, as you know, there are three layers of caching. There's a memory controller. Uh, and so on and so forth. There are many, many, many components on this processor that really are completely irrelevant and unuseful when you're trying to evaluate a hash function like SHA-256. So if you think about it, the actual uh, piece of the hardware that evaluates SHA-256 are these four little squares here. You notice the squares, there's one little square um, in every core. And it's just this tiny amount of hardware on the processor that's actually being used to evaluate SHA-256. So it should be very clear that if all I want to do is just do a dictionary attack, I would never use an Intel processor off the shelf because, you know, very little hardware and very little silicon in the processor is actually used to evaluate SHA-256. So my question to you was how much faster would uh, commodity hardware be compared to, uh, to an Intel processor? And let's see what you guys answered. Ah, so everybody says about 500,000 times faster. So you guys are very pessimistic. You think commodity hardware can be made like super duper faster than uh, Intel processors. Well, so here's what we did. Um, uh, well, here's what I did. I just looked up essentially how long does it take to, uh, uh, to do SHA-256 and come out on custom hardware. And the folks that are interested in speeding up uh, uh, SHA-256s are the folks that are doing Bitcoin mining. And so Bitcoin miners, when you look at the processors they build, there's no, there's no memory controllers, there are no caches on those processors. All those process do, processors do is they just kind of uh, flood the, the, the processor with just copies of uh, the memory control, of the SHA-256 engine. Uh, so A, the engine is optimized, and, and, and second of all, it's replicated all over the processor. So you don't have, just have four engines per core, you have thousands of engines per core. And you can see that uh, if you just go to Amazon and buy just a Bitcoin mining uh, rig, uh, they cost about $1,700, and their price is constantly falling. And you can see this is on a lot of scale uh, that um, it's about 50,000 times faster than, uh, come out, than, than just an Intel processor. So not quite as pessimistic as you guys were expecting, but still far, far, far faster. So again, if the Intel processor 
can do a thousand sh uh, hashes per second, the attacker using dedicated hardware can do 50 million hashes per second. So essentially, the uh, dictionary attack is re-enabled because the attacker can run through large portions of the dictionary very fast. Okay, so uh, simply using a slow hash function doesn't really prevent the attacker from doing a dictionary attack because commodity hardware is so much faster than the Intel processor. So what do we do? So what do we do? So a beautiful idea actually appeared uh, a couple of years ago. This is this idea that's used in S script. Um, and this idea is really elegant. So the idea basically says, well, let's use a hash function that isn't just slow, that isn't just hard to evaluate, but also takes a lot of memory to evaluate as you're computing the hash function. So now, if you think about what the custom hardware has to do, it can't just use a little piece of silicon to compute the hash function. It has to use the little piece of silicon, but right next to it, it has to allocate a large buffer of memory that's, that's needed to evaluate the hash function. So that's the idea behind S-Script. So if I'm building com uh, dedicated hardware to do dictionary attacks now, I have to kind of, you know, the number of uh, engines I can lay on one chip is sort of limited by the number of memory components that I can put in every chip. And since memory is relatively large, now each one of my chips is not going to have that many hash hashing engines. And so we kind of have, uh, we kind of have um, more equality between the actual website's hardware and the attacker's hardware. Again, because the attacker cannot replicate uh, using dedicated hardware, the attacker cannot put too many hashing engine engines on each chip because each engine needs a lot of memory. And memory takes space, space on the chip. Okay, so, so that's S-Script, and that's actually a fine thing to use. There's one problem with S-Script, however, which is that in S-Script, if you look at the, how, memory, how this memory is being accessed as you're evaluating the hash function, it turns out the memory access pattern actually depends on the password that the user supplied. Okay, so for my password, there would be one particular memory access pattern. For your password, there would be a different memory access pattern. Now, you might have heard of uh, what, call, what are called cache timing attacks, where essentially an attacker who is able to uh, actually gain uh, a low privilege control of the web server, so the attacker sits on the web server but just has low uh, privilege access to it, uh, just by having a foothold on the web server, you can actually get a lot of information as to how a high privilege process is accessing memory. Okay, so basically what you're doing is you're kind of looking at how, as a low privilege mem uh, process, process, you're looking at how the cache is being used. And by looking at how the cache is being used, you can figure out how the high privilege process is accessing memory. You can't read the password that the high privilege process is, is uh, processing, but you can see how the high privilege process is accessing memory. Well, if you can do that, as I'm entering my password, you can just measure uh, what the memory access pattern is. And now when an attacker uh, recovers, say, the hashed password plus the memory access pattern, uh, as, the, as, the, as the hash function was being evaluated, that essentially eliminates the memory requirements for uh, computing the hash function. Because what the attacker would do is he would just try one password after another, but he wouldn't actually evaluate the hash function. He would just kind of compute the memory access pattern associated with the hash, func with the hash function. And as soon as he sees that the word, say, you know, one, two, three, four, five, does not match the memory access pattern that the user uh, generated with his password, he knows that the user's password is not 12345. So again, he can re-instantiate the offline dictionary attack without memory, just using the memory access pattern. So I hope that was clear, but essentially what it says is that S-Script, again, it's a wonderful, wonderful idea um, in that it requires the attacker to, to uh, spend a lot of memory in order to evaluate the hash function, uh, but the minute the attacker has a little bit of side information, in particular, the memory access patterns as the hash function is being evaluated, that essentially uh, allows the attacker to now test words in the dictionary without memory, and now we're back to a, a problematic custom ASIC attack. Okay, so that's the issue with S-Script. And so the question is, what do we do about that? Is there a better solution? And so again, there's been progress on this recently. The question that we're kind of asking, is there a space hard function where in fact, uh, the time to evaluate the hash function is independent of the password? And the answer is yes, there actually is such a thing. And uh, here, let me show you. The hash function is called, uh, this hash function is called uh, argon2. 
And it was actually the, announced the winner of this password hashing competition that concluded recently. And the, the nice thing about Argon2 is it's supposedly space hard, and at the same time, it's in the memory access pattern is independent of the password. So the attack that I just described presumably would be, would be difficult to mount. So the one issue with Argon2 is it's not, there's no kind of um, a rigorous security proof to argue that it really is uh, space hard as is claimed. And so one of the things that we were interested in is basically can we come up with the same prop with a hash function that has the same properties as argon 2i but actually has a proof that it cannot be evaluated with less memory than what's claimed. And so the the hash function we came up as came up with is called balloon hashing. This is joint work with one of my students Henry Corrigan Gibbs and uh, Stuart Schuchter, who uh, is at Microsoft Research. And the properties of the hash function, essentially, as we said, it's a, it has a password-independent access pattern, memory-independent access pattern, so you can't do the attack that I just described. Uh, it uses basically standard crypto primitives, namely it's just based on SHA-256. So everything here is kind of uh, standardized based on primitives we all know and love. It's actually uh, quite fast and definitely can achieve, you know, rates of 1,000 hashes per second, uh, so, it is, so it can be used on real-world servers. And the interesting property is that, in fact, it has um, a proof of security in the following sense. If you try to evaluate it um, with less space than claimed, in particular, suppose you try to evaluate it with, evaluate it with a quarter of the space that uh, we claim is required, then the amount of work to, to do the evaluation actually kind of blows up exponentially. So if you evaluate it with however much space we said is needed, then you can do it at 1,000 times a second. If you try to evaluate it with a quarter of the space that we said is needed, all of a sudden the total amount of work blows up exponentially. So that's kind of a proof that, uh, you know, at least when it comes to the total amount of work you have to do, uh, that uh, can't be, that, that evaluation can't be done without space. So again, if the attacker is trying to build custom ASICs to do a dictionary attack, he has to spend a lot of space um, to, uh, to mount the attack. Now, one thing that's interesting is we were primarily interested in the total amount of work that's needed to evaluate the hash function uh, with, with less space. But it turns out um, if you're going to build something that's mem that's, that has uh, that's, um, memory access pattern independent of the password, uh, then it turns out there's um, essentially uh, kind of a, a, an impossibility result that says that uh, any such scheme, including Argon2i and Balloon, is, is going to be subject to what's called a parallel speedup. So in other words, even though the total amount of work that the attacker has to do has to be quite large, the attacker can still speed up some of what he's doing by kind of laying out multiple cores on his, on his, um, on his processor. So we're kind of, um, we have to have a, we need to choose between two uh, options. Either we have a hash function where the memory access pattern depends on the password, and then you're vulnerable to the attack that I described before, or you have one where the memory access pattern is independent of the password, but then you have to worry about these parallel speedup attacks. And so what we're actually recommending now is that since, you know, we can't kind of have the best of both worlds, let's do, let's do both. So kind of the natural thing to do is maybe you use Balloon or Argon2i to hash the password first. That prevents uh, these um, memory access pattern attacks. And then you apply Scripts so that uh, the memory access pattern attack would only apply to the hash password, not the original password. So basically, if you compose Balloon on Arg or Argon2i with Scripts, in some sense, you kind of get uh, the best of both worlds. Okay, so that's, that's one option to use. So kind of that's what's been happening in the space of password hashing. It's kind of interesting. There's been recent developments, as you can see. Uh, so there's lots to say on how to do proper password hashing. Um, this, this is all very new material. Uh, it has not been standardized yet. Um, and so if you're considering um, uh, mo moving away from PDKDF2, you should, because PDKDF2 is relatively old at this point. Um, but uh, what to move to yet is actually still, as you can see, a very active area of research. So don't change what you're doing, just wait, just, just yet, just wait a little bit more, but just realize that there's actually very active and uh, interesting research going on in the space. I wanted to show, also show you what the balloon hashing function actually, actually looks like. So, you know, I can't give a presentation without actually giving you a little bit of code. So let me show you what these space hard functions uh, look like and how they operate. So uh, let's see. So the way they work is basically, as, as I said, they take as input the password, the salt for the password, the space requirements, 
and the time requirement. Okay, so what we do is first we allocate a buffer where the password will be where, um, where, where that, that is going to contain the large amount of memory that's needed to evaluate the hash function. The next thing we do is uh, we basically fill up the, this buffer using values derived from the password, the password and the salt. So what we do is basically, as you can see here, we're kind of uh, hashing the password and the salt, and all we're doing in this loop here is just filling up the buffer using uh, values derived from the password. And we're using, as I said, a hash function here. As you can see this hash function, this would just be like SHA-256 or so. All right. So then um, the next thing we do is we're going to do a number of iterations. So this is going to depend on the time cost. So you can see the time cost variable here. Um, uh, the, more iterate, the more you iterate, uh, the more secure the hash function becomes uh, in a certain sense, which I won't make explicit here. And then what we do is basically every, every iteration, we loop through the buffer and do the following steps. Basically, um, we change, uh, so we take the previous value in the buffer. In other words, we take the, uh, you know, when we're looking at element number m, actually prev is just the value of the buffer at element at position m minus 1. And then we hash that, so we hash the element at position m minus 1 with the element at position m. Okay, so we just hash two consecutive values. And then in addition, we hash a few more values. We kind of choose 20 more values uh, to hash. And uh, all those values basically form the new value at position m. And as you can see, we're kind of doing a linear scan through the buffer. And at every step in the buffer, we're basically hashing, well, essentially 21 values uh, into this uh, position m in the buffer. And m just kind of increments sequentially uh, one after another. So that's it. That's the whole hash function. We iterate this over and over and over again. And finally, the final output is the last entry in the buffer. So it's kind of cool that this hash function just fits on a single page. Uh, it's very easy to see how it works. And as I said, most of the work is in proving that, in fact, um, the total amount of work that has to be done to evaluate this function must take a lot of memory. Okay? So there's an accompanying proof of security that shows that if you try to evaluate this function with little memory, the running time would actually blow up. All right. So that's what I wanted to tell you about uh, password hashing. Now we're going to change gears a little bit. I see that I have 10 more minutes. So we're going to change gears a little bit. I hope in the remaining 10 minutes I can tell you about a completely different topic that we've been working on having to do with uh, control flow integrity. So this is joint work uh, with uh, our students, Ali uh, Mastizeta, Andrew Bitao, a professor here at David Mazieres, and, and myself. OK, so let me tell you what this is about. So complete change of gear from password hashing onto con control flow integrity. All right, so control flow integrity is a wonderful, wonderful idea uh, due to a body back in 2005. And the idea is essentially it's a way to prevent what are called control hijacking attacks, where the attacker tries to take c control of how the program executes. So you know about buffer overflow attacks, return oriented programming attacks. I hope you know about these things. If you don't know about these types of attacks, please, please take our um, secure programming course where we go into extreme depth about all these, uh, all these attacks and how they operate. Okay, so uh, the goal of control flow integrity is basically to protect a program from these control hijacking attacks where the attacker basically um, is able to, to essentially uh, take control of how control flow operates, of how control flow flows, and in that, basically, that allows the attacker to do, uh, to cause lots of damage uh, to the program. Okay, so there's actually a lot of academic research on control flow integrity. There's actually, you know, there's a lot of systems that I just gave some examples here. Uh, and there's also a bunch of attacks on these systems and so on. So this is a very active area of research. Um, let me tell you, instead of going through all the previous work, let me kind of tell you what this is about. And I'll tell you kind of um, what, what we've done. All right, so how does control flow integrity work? Uh, well, again, as I said, there are many, 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 many proposals. The cool thing is that actually in Windows 10, this has actually been deployed by Microsoft in, um, in different systems called MX and Control Flow Guard. Uh, let me just tell you how Control Flow Guard works. So what it does is essentially, um, well, what it does, I would say we consider this as very coarse control flow integrity. But what it does is essentially it builds at, at uh, compile and linking time the compiler essentially builds a table of all possible entry points into different functions in the program, okay? So, you know, maybe you have hundreds of, of, of functions in your program. Essentially, what the compiler does is it lists, literally lists all these uh, possible entry points 
uh, all these possible function entry points in a table, it's represented as a bit vector. Yeah, so there's a big, big bit vector at the beginning of your code that's, that's zero if that particular address is not an entry point for, for a function, and the, the, the bit vector is one if that address is an entry point for a function. And then every time you make an indirect call, so here, you know, you can see that you're, you're kind of making um, uh, an indirect call, say, you know, a method invocation or so on. What the program actually does is it takes the address of the indirect call and then calls this extra check here. You can see the check that's uh, shown here. Essentially, this guard check I call, what it does is it looks at the address that the processor is about to jump to, and it verifies that in the bit vector, the corresponding bit is set to one. In other words, where it's about to jump to really is an entry point to a valid function in the code. So you can't just cause the code to jump wherever you like. You have to jump into a valid entry point in the, in the program. So this makes the uh, control flow, uh, this makes the control hijacking attacks much, much, much harder to do. And you see that if this uh, function uh, basically returns, in other words, you are jumping into a valid function, then the actual call takes place. You can see that we're now calling ESI, which actually calls the function. So the call only happens if you jump to an address that's a valid entry point for a function. Now, so this looks great. Yeah, this is already making these control hijacking attacks much harder. Uh, however, it's not perfect. When the reason it's not perfect is, first of all, you realize it's checking that the attacker is calling some function, but it's not checking that the attacker is calling the correct function, right? So the attacker can still jump to the wrong function, and that will still uh, cause, you know, in some cases, that still lets the attacker take control of the code, uh, and that's not prevented by control flow guard. So again, control flow guard, flow guard is a wonderful, wonderful idea, but you can pretty much see how to get around it by essentially causing the code to jump into the wrong function that's an actual valid function in the program. And the other thing is, why can't we make it more precise? It turns out it's actually non-trivial to build the actual control flow for the, for, the, for the program at compile time. It's much easier to do this dynamically at runtime, and that's kind of what we're uh, trying to do. So let me explain to you what, uh, what we're doing. So we have a different approach to control flow integrity. We call it cryptographic control flow integrity. So rather than um, building it based on code analysis, we're going to build control flow integrity based on crypto. And so let me explain to you, first of all, what are we assuming? So we're assuming the attacker has a lot of power. The threat model that we give the attacker is we say, you know, the attacker can read and write memory anywhere that it wants. So we're given the attacker, this is a remote attacker, say, that's trying to attack the web server, and we're just assuming the attacker can already read and write any point in memory in, for, in this web server, um, uh, in the web server that's running, that's coming under attack. And in fact, we showed, we had a paper actually in 2014, 14, we called this the hacking blind paper, where we actually showed that on a real web server, very, very often attackers can actually induce reads and writes wherever they want. So this is, it sounds like it's giving the attacker too much power, but we actually came up with attacks where that's exactly the amount of power the attacker has. Literally, it can read and write any point in memory. And even though uh, the attacker has so much power, the attacker should not be able to cause the program to deviate from its designated control flow. So again, uh, control flow must proceed at uh, the allowed, it's only at the intended uh, flow and not, and the attacker should not be able to modify that. Okay, so how do we do it? Well, the way we do it is, as I said, using this, uh, co using, uh, this cryptographic control flow integrity idea. What we do is essentially every time control flow depends on a jump address, uh, we're going to uh, provide, we're going to verify integrity of that jump address. In particular, what the code will actually do is every time it writes an address under the heap or onto the stack, it's going to concatenate to this address a 64-bit integrity tag. Okay, so here is how we compute it. Basically, we're, we're, we're going to depend on, on the AES block cipher for this. And again, if you want to learn how AES works, uh, we discussed this at great length in our crypto course. Um, but AES is basically a, is one thing that we can use AES for is to compute integrity tags. And what we do is basically we compute essentially this integrity tag on the jump address uh, plus the source address. And, you know, we pretend a zero if it's on the heap, or we pretend a one if it's on the stack, just so that there's no confusion between addresses on the heap and addresses on the stack. And now you can see that now every single uh, dynamic address on the heap or on the stack is going to have this integrity tag associated with it. And every time we jump to that address, before we jump, 
we actually verify that the tag is valid. So essentially what the program is doing is making sure that um, that jump address was actually generated by the program and not by the attacker. So we only jump to addresses that the program generates and not addresses that the attacker controls. Now, you should be asking, when you look at this, you should already be wondering, where is this key K going to be stored, right? I told you that the attacker can read and write any point in memory, so if we store the key K in memory, the attacker can just read it, and once he has the key K, he can forge these tags by himself, and he can defeat the mechanism. So the question is, where do we store this key K so the attacker can't get at it, at it? And the answer is we're going to store it actually in uh, an XMM register. So this key always lives in registers on the processor, and it's never, never, ever written to main memory. So the attacker can't, uh, can't actually read it. And it turns out many programs actually don't use the XMM registers. XMM registers are um, sort of extensions, extended registers in the processor. Uh, many programs don't actually use it. Uh, and as long as they don't use it, you know, we can put our key there. Interestingly, OpenSSL actually ends up using the XMM registers. And so to make OpenSSL work with this, uh, this is OpenSSL as a crypto library. We actually had to do uh, extra work. But again, that's all described in our paper, and I won't describe that here for the, in the interest of time. So just to complete this, uh, this topic, you must be thinking that we're completely nuts in that, again, if you think about what we're proposing, is every time uh, an address is written to heap or stack, we compute uh, an, an AES integrity tag on, it, a tag on it, and every time we jump to that address, we verify the tag. So if you think about how many times we have to compute AES as the program is running, it sounds like this is just going to have horrible performance implications, but it turns out actually it doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah, so we implemented this in LLVM. We tried this on a lot of kind of common applications, and the slowdown, you know, it is, there is definitely a penalty to doing this, but the slowdown is not like out of the, you know, out of the, out of uh, completely, uh, completely unreasonable. There is a slowdown, but it, it does provide quite a strong level of defense. So how are we able to get this to be uh, so fast? And the answer is, again, something you guys should be aware of, which is, thank you, Intel. Intel has actually made amazing progress in making AES run fast on the x86 processor. So Intel added these instructions called the AES NI instructions. NI stands for new instructions. And what they did essentially is they implemented AES in hardware. So um, there's an AES ink instruction now that implements one round of the AES cipher. So if you want to, if you want to do an AES encryption, all you have to do is just call AES ink 10 times for the 10 rounds of AES. And that's essentially one um, evaluation of AES. And in fact, as you can see, over the years, Intel has actually made AES even faster um, as uh, this has been such a successful uh, project for them that AES speed is, is constantly improving. And the faster it gets, the lower the overhead for our, for our system. Moreover, they even, they even made these AES evaluations fully pipelined. So the throughput for evaluating AES essentially is, is uh, you know, almost one cycle per, uh, per one AES round. Uh, yeah, so this is quite remarkable. And because of these AES instructions, we're able to, uh, to get the performance for our uh, method to run at a reasonable rate. Okay, so uh, yeah, so I wanted to just point, tell you that these AES, the fact that there's AES available in hardware is great for crypto on the wire, but it's also great for uh, securing applications, for example, by using, by, by providing the strong control flow integrity. All right, so these are two projects I wanted to tell you about. I guess we're going to, I wanted to tell you more about Internet of Things, things we're doing, but I guess we will do that at a future webinar. So thanks, everyone, for the questions. Terrific questions. Um, so let's see. So uh, let's get to as many of these as we can. Uh, so how do GPUs impact the practical implications, ability for evaluating or brute, force, brute, brute forcing hash functions? So that's a great question, actually. So for hash functions that are not space hard, um, GPUs actually are quite detrimental, right? So again, a GPU has many, many cores, and as a result, you can actually evaluate um, many iterations of the hash function at once, and that allows you to speed up the, uh, the uh, dictionary attacks significantly. So memory hard functions, so functions that require a lot of memory to evaluate, are much harder to run on a GPU, especially because every core, for every evaluation of the hash function, the core has to allocate a lot of memory for evalu evaluating that hash function. And as a, as a result, uh, it's actually quite, quite difficult to do on a GPU. So if you're worried about GPU-based attacks, definitely you need to use a space-hard hash function 
like Balloon or Argon or Escript, and uh, you should not be using PBKDF2. Generally, I hope I convinced you in this presentation that PBKDF2 is at this point essentially on its way out. Yeah, and in, in, in a few years, uh, once, the, once the discussion of uh, the next generation hash functions is settled, we will not be using PBKDF2 anymore. We really should be using space hard functions. Okay, the second question is basically about having to remember lots of passwords. And uh, the, 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 uh, the question is about uh, why not use password managers? Of course, password managers themselves also get hacked, so why shouldn't we just get rid of passwords altogether? I couldn't agree more, couldn't agree more. So, um, in fact, I'm a very big supporter of uh, second factor authentication. Um, uh, Google Authenticator is a fantastic tool. If um, you're running a website, you should, all, you should integrate Google Authenticator into your, your website. Um, to let people use it. You should advertise it for your users. Uh, and um, there are even better mechanisms now for uh, second factor authentication, challenge response based. If you're uh, familiar with companies like Duo, they've made that even easier to use. Um, and so definitely uh, I couldn't agree more and that's a, a, a question that's right on target. Uh, the next question is uh, how much memory are we talking about? So generally for these space hard functions, whether it's S-script, Argon, or Balloon, Essentially, what we try to do is fill up the L3 cache. So we don't quite fill, we don't go to main memory because that actually would not let us uh, achieve the thousand hashes per second we're aiming for. But the goal here is to fill up the L3 cache. So when I talked about, I showed you the pseudocode, the buffer and the pseudocode essentially would be as big as your L3 cache. Uh, okay, let's see. So my next question uh, is about CCFI. Um, uh, yeah, how would this impact uh, mobile devices? You know, the answer is you, you could, so uh, I guess on mobile devices you would be using, uh, they're not using uh, Intel processors so much. Those are more ARM-based architectures. So first of all, ARM has also, given the success of AESNI, ARM has also introduced AESNI into, the, into many of, their, of, the, of the ARM designs. And so um, it's exactly the same API as on the x86. And so in principle, CCFI could be used on mobile devices as well. Any, one, any mobile device that supports AESNI and my point was that the faster the hardware implementation of AES is, the less overhead that CCFI will take, and it really does provide quite a strong measure of uh, security against control, control hijacking attacks. And so in principle, this could be used on mobile devices. Again, there's a performance penalty, but there's also a, a strong security benefit. Okay, um, the next question is about uh, CCFI on Sparks, and it's basically the same answer I just gave, essentially, whenever AES-MI is available, whenever you have AES in hardware, you can actually use it without too much, um, uh, too much penalty, performance penalty. Okay, the next question is about Ring 2. If, I, if the attacker gets control of Ring 2 on the computer, yes, absolutely, then all bets are off. So with Ring 2, you can, do, you can extract the secret key, and then you would defeat this, this attack. Um, uh, well, so the threat model that this is trying to defend against is a model where the attacker uh, has control, uh, has access, read-write access to memory. If the attacker has even more power, then absolutely, there's, uh, that's a much, much, much uh, harder adversary to defend against. Then you would have to go to, um, to virtualization and, and other based approaches. Uh, okay, so that's basically CC5 is designed to defend against memory corruption attacks not so much against uh, ring two based attacks. Uh, can a hacker read write XMM, XMM registers? Yeah, so if a hacker is basically using memory corruption to, uh, to mount his attacks, then he can't, um, he can't have access to XMM registers. If it's a more powerful attacker like the previous question, then absolutely all bets are off. There's no perfect defense. Uh, we were trying, we were basically, control flow integrity generally is trying to uh, prevent memory corruption attacks. And we basically were trying to use, we, we, our, our mechanism is uh, uh, essentially using this uh, cryptographic mechanism to prevent com uh, memory corruption. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, oh, are there programming languages, constructs, compilers that support generation of AES instruction sets? Well, uh, compilers actually don't quite use them today. Typically when you want to use AES and I, you would just inject some assembly code into your, into your higher level programming language uh, and you would compile that in. Uh, so, for example, when you uh, when you use OpenSSL for crypto, OpenSSL actually uh, is when it's on running on the appropriate hardware, it will actually use AESNI, and so automatically by using OpenSSL, you're getting the benefits of of AESNI. But yeah, typically you do have to access it using assembly. 
is the CC5 project going to be open source? Absolutely. So it's implemented as um, uh, into LLVM right now. Uh, yeah, we'll make, obviously this is academic code, so, you know, use it at your own risk. Um, but uh, absolutely, if you're interested in, uh, in studying this or using it or developing more um, on, on CC5, we, we definitely uh, make, make, will make this open source. Um, let's see, on the balloon scheme, where did the number 20 come, came from? That is an excellent, excellent question. I'm really happy to hear uh, someone ask this. So why do we, if you look back to how um, we, we did the hashing, we said that essentially as you do your linear sweep through the buffer, you basically hash 20 elements in the buffer into the current element that you're looking at. So why 20? It turns out uh, the number 20 comes from the security proof. Yeah, so this is the nice thing about doing security proof in that they guide you into how to design the hash function. So if we, if we do include, uh, if we do, do the hashing on 20 elements, that allows us to prove that if you evaluate the hash function with less than quarter of the space that we require, the running time would actually blow up exponentially. Okay, so, and by the way, since you asked uh, about the technicalities, I'll tell you that when I say exponentially, I mean exponentially in the number of rounds that the hash function is, is uh, using. So remember I told you that there's a timing parameter, how many rounds the hash function runs for. So for example, if you run it for 10 or 20 rounds, let's say you run it for 20 rounds, then if you try to evaluate the hash function with a quarter of the space that's required, then necessarily the running time would grow, the total running time, uh, not the parallel running time, the total running time would grow by a factor of a million. Okay, so that's where the number 20 comes from. Basically, it's needed for the proof. Um, uh, right, so you asked about SHA-256. In fact, so in balloon hashing, should we use SHA-256 or a different hash function? So our point was that balloon, that one of the nice features of balloon is it's built from sort of standardized components. And SHA-256 was a reason, was a very common component to use. In fact, uh, the most, of, most of our running times, we, for most of our running times, we actually use SHA-3, which is kind of the, uh, a recent uh, a variation, or, you know, a recent proposal for NIST for a hash function. The reason SHA-3 was better suited for us is because it has a larger block size than SHA-256, and that actually improves performance. So, um, yeah, but essentially you can use any standardized hash function you want. If you want uh, the fastest possible performance, then uh, you would use a hash function with a large block cipher. So just use any of the standardized ones. We just happen to use uh, SHA-3 for, for, for running times. Uh, let's see, any research on the crypto biometrics or related crypto authentication? Absolutely, there's a lot of research on using biometrics for authentication in a crypto sense. Um, the question is, how do you do hashing when the credential is a biometric, right? So if I have my, if the biometric is a fingerprint, the credential of the fingerprint, uh, well, when I read it initially, I get one version of the fingerprint. When I read it uh, later on, I get a different version of the fingerprint that might be a little bit different. Uh, and the question is, how do we compare the two? Traditionally, when you do biometrics, you kind of extract, extract what's called a sketch from the fingerprint, and then you compare the sketch, the sketch that was registered from the sketch that was, re that was read at a later time. The sketches don't have to fit perfectly, they just have to be close to one another. So the question is, um, if we do hashing, how do we do the comparison if the sketches only need to be close but don't have to be perfectly equal? And the answer is there's actually something called fuzzy hashing, which if actually is relevant for biometrics. Um, again, so if you're interested in that, just Google fuzzy hashing, and you'll see a whole bunch of papers on how to do hashing for the purpose of uh, biometrics. Okay, so that's gonna wrap up our live session. Uh, on behalf of the Stanford Center for Professional Development, I'd like to thank you for joining us for our webinar on uh, Hash Hacks Code, Emerging Trends in Cybersecurity. There are still a number of questions in the queue which we will go ahead and respond to offline. So thank you again for joining us and have a great day. Uh, breach where, um, in fact, encrypted passwords, not hash passwords, were revealed um, in addition to the password hints. So as a result, uh, the password hints actually helped attackers recover the original passwords. And then furthermore, um, just a more recent example, in 2015, a, a famous, um, a, a, a fairly common uh, password manager was actually, had an issue where, in fact, uh, hashed master passwords and assaults 
uh, were compromised. And again, that um, can, in some cases, that can enable the, what's called an offline dictionary attack, where an attacker can, can try lots of words in the dictionary until he finds one that hashes to the user's password, and that essentially reveals the user's password. So the question is uh, what to do about that. And so um, this was just a quick uh, survey of what's happening. The question is, can we, how do we store passwords in a way that makes these offline dictionary attacks harder than uh, simply just trying all the words in a dictionary? So let's talk about you know, uh, how to store passwords 101. And so of course, I hope everybody knows that you ever, never, ever, ever, ever store passwords in the clear on the server. What you actually do on the server is you store uh, a hash of the password. Here you can see the hash of the password along with a salt. The salt is denoted by SA and the salt is also stored uh, in the database. And then when a, when a user um, submits a pass in a dictionary and simply try to hash each one of them until they got ones that hit values in the password database and that enabled them to recover the original passwords. So in some sense, this is kind of counterintuitive into what's happening in computer science. Typically, we want things to run fast, as fast as possible. When we hash passwords, actually speed is detrimental to security because the faster the hash function is, the faster an attacker can try uh, all words in the dictionary until he, rec he recovers the user's password. So what we really want for password hashing is much, much, much slower passwords. And by the way, I should say that LinkedIn has since updated their uh, password scheme, and now this is this type of attack is not going to happen again on LinkedIn. So that's um, at least we hope, and so that's actually good news. And so the question I want to ask basically is, what is the right way to hash passwords? And so basically, there are kind of two ideas that come to that come to play. Uh, the first one is when we hash a password on the server side, one thing we might want to do is instead of just using um, a simple hash function where we directly just give it as input the user's password, we actually use what's called a keyed hash function. So a function that in addition to the password also takes a secret key. The secret key itself is going to be stored in some hardware security module, what's called an HSM. So the secret key itself is going to Great, thank you, Michelle. And uh, let's get started. Welcome, everyone, to this webinar. Um, I guess I'm going to tell you about a few things that we've been working on recently, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. So let's see. So let's get started. Um, as I said, what I wanted to tell you about today is some, some areas that we've been working in our security lab lately. In particular, I wanted to tell you a little bit about new developments in password hashing, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, sort of a new approach we developed for uh, securing program control flow. This falls into the area of what's called control flow integrity, and I'll tell you about a new technique for control flow integrity. Hopefully, we'll still have some more time, and then I'll be able to tell you about uh, other recent work that we've been doing, uh, specifically on uh, IoT security. In particular, how do we know that IoT devices are not revealing too much information about their owner? So. Again, kind of an exciting uh, area, having to being an intersection of privacy and security. So I hope we'll, I hope we'll get through all three topics. But if not, I guess we will schedule future webinars and we will cover whatever we didn't cover today in a in a future webinar. Okay. So with that, let's get started with password hashing. And let me remind you a little bit about how password password uh, for login. What the server actually does is it simply hashes the password along with the salt and checks whether that's equal to the stored hash in the database, and if it is equal, then the login is allowed to go through. So again, this is uh, why we use assault and so on. This is uh, fairly common reasoning in computer security. We discuss this actually at quite a bit of length in the computer security class uh, that we teach, uh, which again, you are very uh, welcome to, to, to sign up for and attend. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about the reasons for the salt here. What I want to talk about today is, is, is this question of what, what hash function should be using um, for hashing passwords. So how do we actually hash passwords when we store them in the password database? So what happened with LinkedIn is unfortunately they used a SHA-1 hash of their password. And in fact, the SHA-1 hash was even unsalted. So literally all they did is they computed a SHA-1 hash of everybody's password, and that's the value that was stored in the, in the uh, password database. When that password database was compromised, within six days, almost all the plain text passwords were exposed. So 90% of the passwords were actually revealed, 
And the reason that was possible is because SHA-1 is an extremely hash, fast hash function to evaluate. So uh, what uh, folks were able to do is run through a large dictionary, um, you know, a very, very large set of dictionary of, of possible password hashing works and kind of the areas that we're uh, interested in, uh, we've been working on recently. So, of course, everybody knows, you know, there are constant attacks on server-side password databases that result in large-scale password breaches. So I just collected a random sample, you know, this is a very small uh, sample of the actual breaches that have happened in the last couple of years. Um, so just to remind you, you probably you remember in the, a few years ago, LinkedIn lost um, a collection of, of uh, hashed passwords that they stored. Unfortunately, they simply stored hashes, SHA-1 hashes of their password. These were unsalted, and we'll talk about the consequence of that in just a minute. Um, so that, that was one event that, lost, that resulted in the loss of 6 million passwords. All these people had to uh, go in and uh, reset their passwords. Of course, when a password breach occurs, um, whoever does the breach is able, in many cases, to obtain many of the original unhashed passwords, and those can then be used to attack those users on other sites as well, because unfortunately still many users use the same password at many different sites. And again, we'll talk about mitigations for that in just a minute. Uh, then later on, uh, a year later, there, was a, there were a couple of other breaches. Again, this is just a selected list. Uh, so there was um, 250,000 passwords were uh, stolen from Twitter. Evernote had an issue where hash passwords were, were revealed. And Adobe had an entertaining 